Hey, good morning, Forex traders. Let's trade some Forex. Let's go. camera it's not hooked up properly but <laughs> guess I can do this so good morning everybody my name is Wayne McDonald I'm the chief FX market strategist for tradersway.com but I'm just like you I'm a currency trader I love currency trading I've been trading currencies forever and ever and ever traders way asked me to say hey we want our customers to succeed we want our customers to be profitable we want our customers to be happy I'm like, hey man, let's make them happy. Let's make them successful. So that's what I'm here to do. So if you're willing to work your butt off, blood, sweat, and tears for years, I'll be here for you. I've been doing these webinars for 15 years. Almost 5,000 videos on YouTube. It's a lot of videos. So I'm here to help you every single day. You still have to step up, and make it happen. But once you find the skills you need and the confidence you need to be successful, we're hoping that you'll pay it back by choosing Trader's Way as the prime broker to your new successful Forex trading business. So start today, download, uh, open up a demo account, download an MT4. In the link below of this video, you can download my chart templates for free. Bam! Just like that, you have the knowledge and the tools you need to succeed. It's pretty smart, huh? Yeah, totally smart. Of course it's smart. <laughs> so anyways, hey, sorry, I'm snacking away. So what do we want to do? Let's go through the calendar today. Let's go through commodities. Let's go through uh, yen pairs, dollar pairs, Swissy pairs. That's probably all the time we'll have for today. Don't forget, this Friday is non-farm payrolls. So we got that coming up as well. So put that on your calendar. When I do that... Not at Forex start today, but FX Street. Cool, right? All right, so let's uh, let's go over here. Beep, beep. Let me get a little more comfortable. What's up, Billy? BT in the house. All right, so let me move over here. Yeah. Hey, me. Oh, come on. All right, there's me. Hi, me. Let's do uh, let's do this. Zero. Have I ever told you you're my zero? All right. So I'm just still not used to the screen. It's ridiculous. So nothing has changed for you, but I, I used to struggle to read this, this screen, and now it's like, <laughs> it's like a billboard. <gasps> the Forex dot today calendar. I'm like, oh my God, I can see everything. I'm so glad I bought this. See, where were you? Dude, it's a holiday in the United States of America. So if you were trading, but while the markets were closed, shame on you. You need to be more in tune. You need to be more in tune to the global market. If right, if London banks are closed, if American banks are closed, you probably shouldn't be trading, and but you probably should know that. So put it on your calendar. Like I'm not joking. I'm not trying to be little and stuff. Um, you should go. How about this? Go to the New York Stock Exchange website and look and write down in your calendar the days the New York Stock Exchange is closed or even half days, half closed and closed. Put that on your calendar. Those are days you probably shouldn't be uh, trading. And it's 
It's not that the New York Stock Exchange is closed. It's that banks are likely closed. Bond trading is likely closed. You know, normal volume of trading is likely diminished exponentially. Well, Alex, on the long run, it probably doesn't affect it at all. I'm just saying for, for that, just like all traders should do this. You should have that down. Okay, guys? When American, uh, because, you know, obviously the U.S. financial markets, the bond markets, the stock market, banking, you know, if those markets are closed, it significantly changes uh, the market. And what we do is highly sensitive to that because we literally, or is it literally, literally, we need business person over here and business person over there. We'd have to fit in the camera. Okay, business person over here wants to do business person with over there. The problem is they're in different countries. So they have this exchange of goods and services, but in the middle they have to exchange currencies and then boom, boom, right? Uh, we need that deal done. If nobody is doing the deal because it's a holiday, or let's say significantly less people are doing deals because it's holidays, then what we do is going to be directly impacted because they won't actually do the deal. So now that leaves us vulnerable, especially if all you do is technical analysis. If that's all you do, you're like, that's all I, the price tells me everything. Well, the problem with that is you're going to go in the market, you're going to lose money and you'll say, well, why didn't the technical analysis work? Well, remember, technical analysis is a self-fulfilling prophecy, but it doesn't work if you're only trading with yourself. See what I mean? So, like, seriously, write it down. It's a, it's a lesson. You should know this, and you should know these dates. And you should not just know it, but understand why. And I, I try to explain that in a logical, intelligent fashion, and I think you got it. Okay? So that's where I was yesterday. Uh, here's an economic point of view, and then we'll do the calendar, okay? So two weekends ago, like 10 days ago, uh, I spent the, the weekend at the Ritz-Carlton. Super fancy, super expensive. Every time I took the kids for lunch, it's, you know, 200 bucks. Dinners and every cocktail is 20 bucks. You know, like... You're like, I need another one, I need another one, I need another one. But, you know, it's crazy expensive, unbelievably beautiful, right? The hotel, 100% packed, 100% packed. Uh, um, I, I, we roll into the concierge on the first day, and I'm like, uh, the concierge is like, hey, do you need uh, anything for me? And I'm like, I need a ski boat, preferably a wake boat. And I want it delivered on Sunday or Saturday, I think. Saturday and afternoon, she's like, how about Saturday at 3? We'll bring it to the dock. That's what I want. Anything else, sir? Hey, do you have one of those giant things you tow behind and the kids are on screaming and yelling? Like, yeah, we got a towable. I need one of those. Great. What else do you need, sir? I need reservations at the steak restaurant. Sorry, we're booked. No, 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 no. <laughs> I'm platinum level. I would like to have dinner in the steakhouse. Sorry, sir, fully booked, <laughs> right? So there's the economy for you, right? Like the hotel fully booked, steakhouse, sorry, n no reservations, 100% booked, okay? So there's one point of the economy. Now, this, this weekend that we just had, I had a different experience. The family and I hiked up a mountain, hiked up the mountain, Right. And at the very, very top, there's a, uh, a hotel, believe it or not. It's a really nice one, actually. Um, you, you check into the well, first of all, you walk in sort of a, a covered area uh, with swings and you're so tired. You just take your big backpack off and you sit on the swings like, oh, my God, I'm so tired. And then finally, you go up into the lobby and you check in. And that's the bunkhouse on either side of the lobby. There's all these rooms that you can check in. The only way up is to hike, right? And you get this lobby. It's a nice uh, lobby and, and stuff like that. And then you can go down to the bathhouse. They have beautiful baths and all that kind of stuff and all composting type toilets. And then you walk down. There's the mess hall and kitchen and you eat 
uh, family style. So our family sat with another family and there's all these things that bring out all the nice food. And then you go down another level and there's a sort of a Vista room with games and all this kind of stuff. And, you know, millennials have their big beards and their man buns and, you know, I'm so organic, right? And everyone's hiking up and it's the opposite. So, uh, <laughs> You know, if like the Ritz Carlton is rich Republicans and this other place was, you know, uh, uh, millennial liberals, right? You hike up there and you have your organic vegetarian, vegetarian dinner. And here's the thing, complete opposite of the Ritz Carlton, right? You sleep on bunks, but it, nice. It's nice, but it's a hike up hotel, completely 100% more than 100% capacity. They had people sleeping on the floors, which they typically don't allow. How's the economy in the United States doing? No, no, no. You're saying way off topic. No, no, it's not. Because I heard someone on uh, Bloomberg today and they're like, oh, well, the economy's bad. I'm like, economy's bad from what point of view, right? <clears throat> so this is a sample of two data sets. Okay. You have the, the rich in their fancy hotel, 100% booked, full capacity. I can't even get a steak. By the way, I ended up getting a steak and it was great. I just didn't go to the steakhouse. Or, same, same state, I'm still in Georgia, not a fancy pants state, right? This is Georgia. Anyways, so then I go to one where you hike up, hike up, hike up, hike up, fully booked. By the way, two nights, no, I'm sorry, one night, right, one night where you hike up to this hotel, $200 per night. So for me and my kids, it was 400 bucks to stay at a hotel at the top of a mountain. You hike up to it and you sleep in bunk beds and the room is this wide. Our room was half the size of my office. I mean, tiny, it was tiny, right? 400 bucks and it's full capacity they couldn't put another living soul on top of that mountain in, inside that hotel how's the economy doing is it only rich people okay so then we hike all the way down this mountain we get back to the uh the lodge at the bottom of the mountain where all the tours come in and get maps and buy a coke right uh, a Hispanic uh, family and their two chub sorry four chubby kids they're pulling up they just walk up from the uh, from the parking lot I guess they're coming to see this the state park right and they're like okay great they, they bought a $70 backpack and about another $30 worth of candies sodas and ice creams, I guess, to make it all the way up to the other parking lot. But this is like, again, I'm watching everyone, like, how are people spending? What are they buying? Are they only buying cheap things? Are they only buying expensive things? Is it only the guys out there with the Porsche Macans? Or is it, you know, who's spending the money? And I'm telling you, I'm seeing every demographic just boom. Let's go to the state park with not even a backpack. Oh, no, no problem. I'll just buy a backpack there. 60 bucks for a backpack, 70 bucks for a backpack. Not a problem. Just, I'm like, so America, guys, America is doing well. I'm like, I'm flabbergasted, flabbergasted at the money people are spending these days. So the consumer, from my observations, and I've always done this, I love walking... And then I talk to people. So how's business? How are you doing? Is this better than last year? What do you think about next year? Are you hiring people? Are we having trouble hiring people? Okay. Now, Joe says, yeah, but we Americans uh, are bad at saving. Well, saving is bad for the economy. Okay. So anyways, uh, just, uh, you know, because not everyone here lives in the United States. So this is just my point of view as a wandering economist. I just wander, wander, hopeless night. Just wondering, like, so I, I'm seeing two very different demographics, or even three different demographics, really, multiple demographics, and everybody is spending money like, like it's free. 
So anyway, it's, it's a point of view. It's a perspective. I don't know if it's like that in your country, but poor people, rich people, and everybody in between just dropping money like there's no tomorrow. Just so things are doing well here. All right. So I'm just sharing that as an economist. All right. Great. Uh, all right, so let's start here. Let's uh, let's just do high impact. Okay. PMI. I don't think PMI is that great, but check this out. You know these are supposed to be above 50, right? <laughs> That's right. Chuck Duck says for the U.S. economy, 70% uh, is consumer spending. You say consumption, but you can be more specific and say con consumer spending, right? Um, but the, the lackluster part of the U.S. economy is business investment. That's the part that's lacking. Okay. But think of it this way. Everyone that wants a job has a job. Wages are going up, right? And if you need money, there is money. So credit, you need credit, availability of credit. You need the credit markets to be flowing. Remember the financial crisis of 2008? The, the credit markets were frozen. There was no credit. Okay. So you need credit, but then what do we need? Well, then that yield curve that we talked about a couple of weeks ago, it needs to be affordable. Okay. So people have jobs. They have high paying jobs and they, and they have future expectations of money. That's the most important thing in economics and even trading. So what's happening is what people think are going to happen. Okay. If they think good things, then they spend. If they think bad things, they stop spending. Okay. Uh, there's a credit available and it's cheap. So yeah, the consumer's doing well. Okay. Just met Robin says, hey, uh, not here in London. Yeah, well, that's self-inflicted wound. So uh, all I can say, though, it, uh, Robin, is uh, thank you for giving us a pathetic pound that will make us tons of money. Right. I did a big speech last week, and I don't know if everyone saw it, but it had to do with looking at the obvious, making an obvious decision, and then just trading that. Okay, so like, dude, Brexit, British pound, sell the hell out of it every day. Wake up, sell the pound, sell the pound, sell. The pound. Hey, you might go a week or two where, when the pound is going up and not down. Well, then you're not going to make a lot of money those two weeks. Like you have to get off the 15 minute chart. But the other 19 weeks, you're just going to make a pile of cash. But you're not thinking like, what should I do today? What should I do this hour? What should I do now? Right. You, so you need to you need to be aggressive in what it is you do. So I asked some of you guys to like do some business plans and all that kind of stuff. Like that's and define what you do. So you, if you can't d describe what you do to somebody, then you don't actually do anything, right? Oh, I sit at my charts and I look for things to do. That's not a th okay. A writer writes always, a trader trades always, right? So what's your bias? Anyways, let's move on. Tomorrow, RBA interest rate decision, okay? Are they going to cut below one? The, I'm, I'm not convinced they are. But that would be, that's going to be a big one. If they drop below 1.0, hmm. Now, September meetings and, no, uh, and December meetings are big meetings. So if they were going to do it, they could do it on this meeting. I'm thinking they're going to delay a couple of months. I mean, right? Is this an old calendar? Is that what this is? No? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm looking at what happened. Oh, yeah. Right, right, right. Sorry. Brain fart. Sorry. Yeah. Well, here's what I was going to say. It still it still matters. Sorry. Brain fart. 
it still matters. What I was thinking, and of course, I'm, I guess I'm right in a weird way. Um, what I'm thinking is you could do it in September. But central bankers, if possible, want to delay further into the semester, if you will, because today is my first actual class of school. I have class tonight. Crazy. Just craziness. So anyways, think of it like the rest of the year is like another semester. People are, uh, bankers are coming back from work, traders, or from holidays, traders are coming back, uh, governments are coming back from their holidays, and they're, they're, gonna, they're thinking between now and the end of the year, right? So the RBA is thinking, we'll probably need to cut, but no one wants to drop below the psychological level of 1.0, and they indicated in the last meeting that they would like to wait so that's what I was going. So before the brain fart, instead of like actually look at the calendar, I was looking internally into my mind and explaining the way I feel. And then, of course, oh, yeah, OK, it looks like they didn't cut. Great. But that's probably what's going to happen. If they're going to do it, they don't really want to do it. So they're going to need some pretty bad data and they're going to kind of push things off um, till the end of the year. You know what I mean? So what would that be? December? Right? Maybe December? Right. And Chuck, that next... So it, it, so Chuck says they did not give an indication of possible cut, so unlikely next meeting. Right. So what's the logic of that? Typically, they would have told us before if they were going to cut today. Okay? If they were going to cut the next meeting, they would have told us today. But they didn't, so it's not the next one. The next one they would tell us they're probably going to cut, if they do. And in that case, the Aussie weakens at that moment because the future expectations will be the RBA will cut. Okay? So then Aussie drops sooner than later. <clears throat> Everyone else will wait till the actual meeting in December and it'll probably drop a little bit and then go up. And people will say, well, why did why'd the Aussie dollar go up when they cut interest rates? Because it's already been played. So that's why I keep telling you guys, news is not fundamentals. So if you're scalping the news, you're like, the RBA cut interest rates, but the Aussie went up. Why, Wayne? Why? Dude, because we already made that money and we already spent it on gas for our yellow Lamborghinis, right? That money is spent and people are just starting to trade it now. So last meeting, right? So six weeks ago, right? So anyways, uh, that's the thought process. So they're not going to cut the next one, as Chuck says, but the next one, they might tell us that the next one after that they'll cut, which would be Dece, the December meeting. So they would have to tell us, what is it, early, early uh, November, I guess. They, that they're thinking about maybe cutting in December, and that's when you get the game on, because it's future expectations, not what's happening now. Let me say it again. What matters is future expectations, not what is happening now. Let me say it a third time. What matters is future expectations. By the way, this means grandfather in sign language. <laughs> grandfather. It's grandfathered in. What matters is future expectations, not what's happening now. If you're doing something now, you're making up a trade plan now for now, you're already behind. You have to really, truly understand that. If you look at something like, oh, I should be on that trade, you're already days in many cases behind, maybe weeks behind. Okay. Chuck Tuck says uh, around Melbourne Cup time, well, yeah, and Brexit. So it's going to get interesting. So people might just wait. Like that Brexit thing is a risk for everybody. Oh, look at this. i got to update this. 8,000 Forex traders. No, 9,000 says. Oh, i got to update that. So anyways, cool. Today, ISM. PMI. Nice. Aussie GDP. Okay. That's going to be interesting. That'll be interesting, huh? Okay. I keep going back to this. This is amazing to me. Um, 
So I told you a week ago or two weeks ago or three weeks ago, I can't remember now, you know, that you should, in, in my quest for macroeconomics to get better, you, it's, it's foolish, especially in market conditions like we have now, fundamentally speaking. It's foolish just to say, I want the yen pairs to weaken, so buy all yen pairs. I said, no, 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 no. You have to be a little smarter than that. So in this case, what is it that I would like to buy? And there wasn't actually any answers, really. There's nothing out there I really would like to buy, right? But like, what would you buy, right? And I looked at things fundamentally. Okay, if macroeconomic conditions change positively, then that would impact trade, that would impact demand, that would impact demand for commodities. Cool. So I'd probably go commodities first, right? So I'm looking at things like CAD, Aussie, Kiwi, and then I'm like, no, but Kiwi's really weak. So really I'm thinking CAD first, Aussie second, maybe Kiwi? And then I start like, well, I don't really want Kiwi. How about like Noki? And I'm like, mm. so then I start looking at more like commodity exotics and stuff and like maybe peso, you know, like, but I'm struggling, like what else could I buy? And then I look at other things that I definitely don't want to buy. And I'm like, you know, look at this, like this, I don't know if you understand this, like that is a ridiculously bad bad on top of bad you know this is like a three-legged dog with fleas by the way i've met several three-legged dogs they're wonderful dogs okay it's it's like i don't know a dead dog with fleas i don't know um it's a dog with fleas um okay it's terrible like it, that is just ridiculously terrible this is bad this is terrible yeah, shockingly bad, as Adam says. Shockingly bad. Okay? Crazy. So, when you hit when you hit 49.9, guys, when you drop from above 50 to below 50, it means your economy is contracting. So, like, 47.4 is bad especially when you thought it'd be 48, 48.5 is bad, but to not to be way off of that, that's like, but terrible, right? But this is like horrific. Like it's bad. So what should you do? Germany is in recession, a manufacturing recession, but Germany is a manufacturing and exporting economy and it's in recession sell the hell out of the euro. Why make this complicated? Okay. The only time the euro will go up with these sort of scenarios is when the dollar is super weak. And that's usually a good thing. So what happens is in that case, if the dollar is super weak, Americans are going to say that they can't afford to buy American companies, like invest in them or stock or build factories here because everything here is expensive. So if the US dollar is weak, it's because investors and businesses have decided, well, why build a factory here when you can't even get factory workers? Remember, I told you the economy is booming here. You can't even get factory workers. Why would you do it here? Go to France, it's 50% unemployment. Go to, go to Portugal, it's 70% unemployment, right? They're giving away real estate for free. Just take it, please, right? So you, you, you do, you, you invest in Europe, and that's where the, the euro goes up. It gets so bad and so cheap that the cheapness attracts investment. This is how capitalism works, by the way. When you understand that, and then you let capitalism work, the world gets to be a better place, Okay. So like the continent of Africa should be in a much better situation because uh, a capitalist would say 
Look at all the natural resources in Africa. Look at all the available workers in Africa. Look at the cheap cost of capital and labor. If I put $1 in to whatever, let's, I won't even say a particular country, but let's say you put $1 in, you might get $20 out in productivity, let's say, but $1 in the United States might only get you 10 cents extra. So you put in another dollar and it only gets you nine extra because it's a mature economy. So it's already fully productive. It's already very efficient. So one more dollar of, in, you know, of capital doesn't, it's diminishing returns, right? But you put it into a country with no capital, boom, the return on capital is huge. So the way capitalism is supposed to work, you're like, hey, Africa, let's come in. Here's some money here. Here's some training here. Let's build some roads. Let's build some railroads. Let's build some airports. Let's put in a seaport. Let's get going. Let's put some factories here. We're going to start making stuff and sending it there, sending it there and all this stuff. And well, then governments get in the way. And, you know, and the same thing with Europe now, I'll pick on France, like, France should be attracting huge flows of capital from around the world, except it probably sucks doing business in France. So people are like, hmm, rather go to Holland. It doesn't suck doing business with the Dutch, right? So anyways, if you get rid of all these problems, then the, the, the flow of capital is unrestricted and it's going to go, right? It's going to go. So right now, things are bad enough in Europe, but the Brexit thing ruins it and all that kind of stuff and red tape and complexity and, you know, all that stuff uh, starts. But that's what the EU is supposed to fix. Remember that? Where if you just want to do business in Europe with 400 million people, it would be easy. Okay? So it ain't easy and that's maybe part of the problem. It's not easy doing business in Africa, by the way. Right? I walk around South Africa and I'm like, this place is wonderful. These people are fantastic. The culture is great. The food is wonderful. The history, oh, complicated. And then you're like, so what would it be like if I started a business here? And it, all of a sudden I'm like, I think it'd be easier. I think it'd be more fun to jump off a bridge. And you're like, Pfft. Like, it's so complicated and there's so many rules and you're like, well, this, none of this makes any sense. So business, people don't want to do business there. And that's really unfortunate, right? Capitalism says, remove all of this. Let's make it easy. And for the flow of capital, right? Just flow the capital in. Let's find uh, where the highest return on capital is going to benefit the business the most. And that's fine somewhere with not much capital and start giving them capital, right? Invest, invest, invest. So anyways, when the economy here is super good and there's no return on a capital because you're already fully efficient, you're already maximizing everything you could possibly maximize. And if you're gonna, if you're gonna like, let's say get 3% more efficiency out of your equipment by upgrading all your equipment and, and quadrupling the, your cost, would you really quadruple your investment? to get one or two or 3% more, you're like, dude, it's a lose-lose. But that's why investment here in the United States is so low, right? And why is, and people also, I hear this, and I don't know if you guys hear this, there's a lot of talk about why is productivity in the United States not growing at the way it used to? Because it's maximized. You can't be any more productive. So the money should go to other places, okay? That, and that's why you want to see a weak U.S. dollar, guys. That's why that's good, where the country with the reserve currency says our country is maximized to the hilt. You can't find workers. And if and my, my machines and my factories are so productive that if I, if I you know, doubled my, the amount of money I put into these things, I'd get like 1% more efficiency out. It, it wouldn't be worth it. Okay. You know what I mean? So then you say, well, then I'm going to invest somewhere else. I'm going to go to Vietnam. I was talking to someone the other, the other day with the, the China thing going on. I'm like, so you, you, you know, you, you know, your country should look at, so his, his company um, is out of China, right? 
And I'm like, oh, well, you should just move your operations to Vietnam. And he's like, no, that's already done. He's like, it's too expensive in Vietnam. We're going to go to Thailand. I'm like, really? Isn't the army still in charge of them? Yeah, yeah. But the return on capital is greater there. No joke. Chinese company with employees in the United States. Well, that's because they're trying to bring the country. You know, but then what? They won't move to Vietnam because it's already too expensive. Why? Capital already flowed there because it was efficient, right? And Vietnam said, bring it on, FDI, foreign direct investment, bring it on. Invest here, hire our people here, and you'll get a better deal. And we'll be cheaper than China. And now it's too expensive because everything's been demanded up. So now money's just going to flow to Thailand. Great. But if you put up walls around that and say, no, don't send your money here, because if you invest your money here, we have all this complex rules and all this stuff and taxes, and you got to hire all these people that you don't want. <laughs> this like, like, dude, I just want to build a factory, and I want to, whoever wants to work here should be able to work here. So anyways, it's just funny. Um, capitalism and, and, and rules don't mix well. You have to have some, but come on. So anyways, that's why... If this Brexit thing is dealt with and maybe these uh, European countries relax some of their rules, um, it, more money would flow there more quickly. And, and at some point, though, when the risk is diminished just enough to cross the mathematical threshold, the dollar will get weak, the euro, the euro will get strong. Why? It'll be at the point where... It, the risk of investing in Europe is just a tick enough. You just have to be enough. Or the, the, the scarcity of deploying capital and stuff in the United States is just expensive enough that you just can't do it here. You're forced to go somewhere else. Then euro dollar is going to go up. Forex, yeah, well, maybe, maybe, but you know, like, I don't know. I, I, have, I, I don't build factories and stuff, and I haven't done the quantitative analysis of an investment in Europe. But I'd have no problem investing into Germany, and I'd have no problem uh, investing into um, the Netherlands. Then after that, it gets complicated. Okay. After that, it gets a little complicated. Is that right, Peter? Yeah. Okay. But why? The Dutch have less rules. They're more ca uh, capitalist inclined. Anyways. Bolandia. Hey, it's the gelati. So anyway, sorry about the uh, diatribe on uh, economics, but there you go. I guess maybe mentally I'm warming up for school. So I'm doing managerial finance and the other one's um, uh, management consulting. And I've forgotten how hard this program is. I, I just reviewed what I'm supposed to do this week and I'm like, I can't do all that. So I got to find another 40 hours a week so I can do school. So you guys should find another 40 hours a week that you just study Forex. By the way, I spent I spent as much time as I possibly could this weekend um, learning, not even school stuff. So just food for thought. All right. So let's move on. Aussie. Yeah, Aussie. This is a big one, right? This is a big one because we're really trying to decide, do we want to own Aussie or not? We know they're cutting interest rates, but they're probably done, maybe, hopefully. And that's the problem. That's where we are. Okay? So we need to see them bottom line so that maybe this it can grow. We need to figure out the whole China scenario and, <laughs> and the negotiations with the United States. But I'm telling you, at least what I think. What I'm guessing, my hypotheses, 
is if we come to a conclusion between China and the United States, Aussie's going to benefit. But I still think we're six months away from that. I think what will happen is by the time the Democrats choose their person, their candidate. So now we're, I don't know, maybe, some, can somebody Google this for us? When is the, uh, what do they call them? The, uh, uh, the Congress, the uh, conference. When, when's the big conference where um, they bring in superstars from Hollywood and say, this is my man, this is my girl. Does anyone know? Anyways, so look at it. Maybe around that time, Trump will be closing, sealing a deal with China. Um, in particular, he'll want one that's going to favor the farmers and manufacturers. No, no, I didn't say after the election. I said the it's the conference, right? It's where the parties choose their candidates. So the Rep Republican Party will actually have to come out and say, we're, we're having Trump represent the Republican Party in the election. But then the Democrat Party has to say, we're choosing, uh, I don't know who they're going to choose. Nobody really has a good message. It's really, really funny. I was reading a book that analyzed this, the basically the sales pitch of every election over the last uh, like six or seven elections. And the person, right, and, and they're, they're like, this is the person that won, and this is what their message promised. And here's what the message was of the losing party. And they went back like multiple elections, right, boom, boom, uh, all the way back, I think, before Clinton. Okay. And you look at who won and what their, what their promise was and who lost and what their promise was, or by promise, I mean like slogan. And then you look at like what Joe Biden is running on right now. And you're like, well, based on this other analysis, he's going to lose. <laughs> like if you just analyze their, uh, but it's funny that maybe a, an entire party of super smart people with all the resources in the world uh, they don't even get that. But anyway, so I'm not I'm not going political here. But it's that day. The, the, yes, the DNC, when they do their Congress and they say, this is our running person, Trump needs to just spike in popularity. And then he'll come out, you know, capitalism, free market is the way to go. You know, the, the Democrats, they're actually communists and they'll go that way. And they'll still diverge big time, right? And the Democrats are going to say, you know, Trump's a, a, a Nazi and all this kind of stuff. And they're, they're, they're going to diverge like crazy. Uh, but that's when Trump needs to shine is right then. You don't want to shine too early because people ha don't remember. So all I'm saying is figure out what that date is. And that's probably when you want to start tiptoeing into Aussie. Maybe... Three weeks before that date, you start tiptoeing into Aussie. But anyways, uh, going into here, GDP is going to be a nice number. But we already know the decision. So with GDP, I often tell you guys, GDP actually doesn't matter because it's so far back looking. Like, here's what we did GDP last quarter. Like, who cares, right? If it mattered it would already be incorporated in the central bank's decision. You see what I mean? Like, this is now, and they'll tell you, this is what we were thinking, this is the information we're looking at, here's our concerns, you know, this is China, this is, you know, the trade wars, this is all of that, right? They're not thinking, like, like even the idea that they're going to hold the meeting before GDP, if this mattered, they, they would have waited. So the fact that the interest rate decision came out a whole day, basically, right before the GDP, just shows you that GDP doesn't actually matter that much. Now, it matters, but the release doesn't matter that much. Now, might, might you get some volatility out of it? Yeah. Yeah, you might make 30 or 40 pips, maybe. I don't think it even moves that much anymore. 
But yeah, okay, so you'll get some volatility for 20 minutes. Yeah, yeah, Chuck Duck says he read the, the statement and says GDP wasn't even mentioned. Yeah, so they're looking at this as an exogenous scenario, that this is all about China, not about Australia. Okay, but anyways, cool, right? So you can trade it, maybe you pick up 25 pips, or you just ignore it and put yourself in a situation where you never lose money. So how, so right, how bad do you need to make another 25 pips? Okay. All right. Now we're talking Wednesday. Now we're talking tomorrow. How about that CAD? So have you analyzed the last two or three RBA, st uh, not R sorry, uh, Bank of Canada statements? Have you looked at the trend in their um, exports? Have you looked at the trend in their, their jobs? Have you looked at the trend in their inflation? And from this, have you calculated some sort of uh, um, trade plan around this announcement based on your uh, knowledge? And if so, did you enter the trade last week? Mid-July? Roger, Roger. Chris says, uh, Argentine stock market down 48%. Yeah, but you also like, uh, their, their interest rates are something like 50% right now. 50%. Problem is they won't pay you back. Is that's the problem. Multiple times in history, recent history, recent meaning in the last twenty-five years, multiple times, Argentine citizens woke up to the news and found out that the government took half the, their money out of their bank accounts. <laughs> How'd you like that feeling, guys? You imagine you're sitting there having coffee. You're like, hey. Another day, another dollar. Turn on the TV. They're like, good morning, Buenos Aires. <laughs> hey, yeah. And they're like, hey, by the way, check your bank account. Your life savings, half of it's missing. Have a wonderful day. You're like, what? You're like, what? That's happened several times in the last 25 years. Sucks to be there. Amazing, huh? I'll say it again, too. Um, I forget the statistic now specifically, but um, Argentina was something like the fifth or sixth richest country in the world. And then socialism came. Now they are, I'm telling you, one of the poorest countries on earth. They have 50% in 50% interest rates. Wow, huh? They used to be richer than Canada. So just think of like Argentina used to be a Canada. Be wonderful country, fantastic people, rich culture, natural resources up the wazoo. Canada's still filthy, stinking rich. In fact, there was a report today that Canada, um, the if you look at the per capita indication of like household wealth, Canadians are even a little richer than the United States, which really pisses off Americans. Right. So this report was great. They were talking about, you know, if you, if you do purchasing power parity version of comparison of the two countries, Canada's richer than the United States. And they're like, and this proves how horrible things are here. I'm like, wait, Canadians being rich 
doesn't have anything to do with the United States being in a bad situation. So the argument is flawed. And then like what? And then my other one's like, what's wrong with Canada? <laughs> right. <laughs> and then the third one is whatever. I forget now, but uh, but Argentina should be like that. So, uh, anyways. Uh, 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 uh. How about Norway? Yeah, Norway is nice. Uh, that's a whole different economic conversation, uh, but that's another great, another great uh, conversation. But the, uh, going back to this though, guys, right? Are you looking ahead? Remember last week I said you need to be thinking a week ahead. Were you thinking about this? Are you long Canadian dollar or anything? Or short the Canadian dollar based on your opinion? Right? Or are you waiting for Wednesday? I just told you, if you're planning today, you've, you're already behind. Yeah, Chuck. Yeah, you know, it, it's such... Traveling is so amazing, right? Where much of what... When you travel now, much of the world is very similar to the rest of the world developed countries right and then every once in a while you just come across a local thing whatever it is that is just foreign like you're like wow i'm totally in a different country so like you can be at a starbucks in tokyo and you're like there's a lot like a starbucks in sweden you know um but then you find something local and you're like wow this is crazy so um i remember seeing people um, with mate, walking around with jugs of hot water for their tea hanging around them, and they're drinking out of like looks like coconuts, and they're drinking out of straws. I'm like, what the hell are these guys drinking like tea? And why do they carry these bags around? They're like, oh, that's the hot water for their tea. And I'm like, what the heck is this? And it's wild, mate. They're like, yeah, I'm in a foreign land, man. It's really neat stuff. All right. Not for our payrolls Friday. Well, I, okay. ISM services uh, Thursday. Actually, this is very interesting. This is probably more important than NFP. Um, so that's really good to have it early. And it's funny, the calendar really is off. There's This, this, this is rarely before NFP. Sometimes it's during NFP. Sometimes it's after NFP. But then I like it before NFP because it fits the model that I published on um, fxstreet.com what, five, six years ago, I published an article, how to trade the employment situation report, how to prepare for and trade the employment situation report. And so I talk about this being in part of the model, when you create a model to that spits out a number, or at least suggests where the number might be. It doesn't actually spit out a number. It just kind of helps you adjust. Um, this is an important component because with ISM services, you should look at the employment subcomponent to the report and then add that, right? Add that to your NFP model, um, as well as things like the Challenger Christmas and Gray report. And you're like, Challenger Christmas and Gray report? What the hell is he talking about? Yeah, well, you got to get schooled, boy. That, that's important. You, you need to know that kind of stuff. Okay. And then, of course, NFP, NFP, NFP. And, of course, they're throwing in some kitty cat the same day, which is, you know, pretty usual. So check that out, guys. Big CAD week, big Aussie week. What should you be trading this week? Maybe some CAD, maybe some Aussie. And then, of course, just keep wake up in the morning right how many times have you heard me do this song you wake up in the morning and it's quarter to two what do you do you sell the euro you sell the euro right so yeah what do you do you should be like that at a cocktail party you're, you're drinking your cocktail and you go, oh this cocktail's good and they're like hey man so what do you do for a living 
I wake up in the morning at a quarter to two. What do I do? I sell the euro. I'm like, dude, this guy's drunk. I sell the euro. <laughs> this, this guy is wasted. Yeah. But you know what you're going to do? It's even in your subconscious, right? And when you get that, you'll be fine. You'll do just fine. Okay. Ooh, let's move on. So I'm hoping for positive macroeconomics. I'm, I'm tr one of the things I'm trying to do is I'm trying to get into Z RAND, otherwise known as Czar. I'm trying to get into Peso. I'm trying to get into Lira because, well, these are exporting countries. These are... Uh, where the well, Turkey should be. It's not really. Uh, but these are countries that will benefit from a lower value dollar. For example, it would these countries would benefit from increased macroeconomic activity like trade. Okay, so they're dangerous as heck. Okay, on this platform, uh, no, I'm not. But uh, say I. I'm really scared that you guys just end up doing what I do and then you shut your brains off. And you say, it doesn't happen to me, Wayne. I don't do that. But I've been doing this so long, I know better. So anyway, so you know I shorted this up high, right? But there's been a second chance and a third chance. So it's like the last thing I want to show is that I'm doing it and then therefore you just say, I guess I should do that too. When, in fact, if you wanted to do it, you had so many chances that that's the big red flag to me. Like, if you still haven't done it. So, remember, I was short, like, here, right? But, of course, there's an obvious pullback. Here's the swing. Like, you didn't do the swing, then you're not a swing trader, right? Then you did it today at London Open, and, like, you still didn't do it. But you had a trade plan. And you, this is based on your bias, based on your research of fundamentals, and you're not doing it? So now the only reason you would do it is if you're like, oh, look, I see Wayne shorting this. I'm like, you're missing the entire point. The raison d'etre is that you make a decision through voodoo magic for all I care. And, but you make a decision and you carry it out. Okay? SL still short makes some basal things to me. Yeah, cool. Right? But that was way up here, right? Cool. But look at the second chance, right? Look at the swing. Look at the, the market open today. Like, there's so many chances to get on this. And then, of course, like, at what price? Well, let me zoom in a little bit here. Okay. <clears throat> What's the swing trade, right? <laughs> What's the uh, front run? <laughs> of course, it's lower high off the shoulder, which I've taught you guys. This is just simple price action now, right? This is like, it's so perfect. What I'm trying to tell you guys is all of this is perfect. It's perfect. All of this is perfect if you're a bear. Okay? These are perfect setups if you have a trade plan. If you don't have a trade plan, then you have no idea what's going on. So, for example, like with the swing trading group, everyone in the swing trading course knows this. That's the weekly sell. That's definitional. It's not an opinion. This is the monthly sell. Okay? So to get the lower high, lower low, lower high, lower. Like, it's, it's, it's as complicated as reciting the ABCs. If you know the ABCs. Look, right? If you have no schooling, then reciting the ABCs is frightening. But you can learn it, is all I'm saying. So if you have a bias and you have a plan, like you're ready, willing, or able, there's one trade which I took for you guys, so it was super obvious. And then here's the follow-up. And then here's the swing, both monthly and weekly. Like None of this is complicated at all. The only way you miss it is if you're not trading it or you don't have a plan. And if you don't have a plan, then I don't want you trading it, right?
right? Those are wonderful, wonderful, wonderful trades. Now, but you might say, well, Wayne, I'm still bullish on the dollar. I'm not bullish on the Mexican peso. I'm not convinced on macroeconomics. There's a lot of reasons why I'm not interested in making this trade right now. Hey, that's great, by the way. That's the kind of attitude I, I want to see and, and, and hear. That's the noise that I like to hear. Because right now, this is still very easily bullish, right? Very easy. Now, if you bought this, uh, even though the U.S. markets were closed, but if you bought this when the market opened on Sunday, because, you know, Forex is open all the time. Just because the U.S. market isn't open doesn't mean you can't trade. And somebody, somebody asked, I think it was Adam, like, well, how does that affect your swing trades? Well, in the long run, it doesn't. You should just always do what you want to do, meaning your bias. If you got the trade set up and you believe you're, you'll be able to move your stop to break even, then take the shot. That's all we care about. You know the trend is going to be your friend. So you take the shot as long as you feel like you're going to do it nearly risk-free. You should have nearly risk-free trades a thousand times a year so that only four or 500 of them are profitable and all the other ones are break-even, right? That'd be great. So you can this you could still be playing it this way all day long. And you, you would be telling yourself right now, if, if you're still a bull, that this hesitation here had to do with the markets being closed. And now that the markets are, are really open, the bulls are going to come back up more news are going to come out, right? News is going to come out and it's going to be dollar strength and it's going to be bad for Mexico and all this kind of stuff. And we've resumed the uptrend. That's totally cool too. The difference is only the opinion. The difference doesn't really affect the trading. So for bulls now, this is their plan A. And this is the plan B. Okay. So someone has already taken the plan A. Yeah, they might get knocked out of break even, or they leave their stop down below S, and they're like, my trade plan for the entire week, my trade plan for the entire week is like this, okay? That would be what they're saying. I don't actually like that. I actually, as a bull, would want this to come down. So, therefore, I would fold this in and say, okay, as a bull, long-term bull, now I'm talking monthly, as a bull, my plan A is here, and that's fine. That's off the central. That's all good. But I also have plan B. So how can I fold in bearish trade plans to drop it down to give me an opportunity to buy at the price I want? See how you're thinking a whole week ahead now, guys. As a bull, you want to buy low. It's not low, it's high. So you want it to come down so you can buy it. It's like drifting. To turn right, you got to turn left. Okay? So you want it to come down so you could buy it. So how do you fit in this week's trade plan? M3 to M1. Okay? So you know somewhere between M1 or even better M2, or sorry, uh, did I, M2 or S2, somewhere in there, ideally even the lower one, is where you want to start buying as a bull. And you say, I'd like that to happen quick, in fact, so you can get the counter trend set up, and you start buying it back this way. And you're probably playing the daily chart. You see that, guys? You're actually playing the daily chart. So now you look at this and you go to there and you start, oops, you go to there, okay? And we're talking about uh, this, okay? Let's throw another one in here. Here's plan A, and you can see plan A is legit, right? So imagine this now, you're on a daily chart, and you're thinking, plan A. Does that seem legitimate? Well, then you have to understand, for that to work, this has to fall.
So yes, you can sell this for a day or two to buy it for the rest of the month if you are a bear. Or sorry, if you are a bull. Okay? So now you got to think more than just what's happening on a 15 minute chart. Can you imagine if all I did was this? What does this tell me? Does this tell me the next three days and then the next 10 days after that? No. And if you're sitting around like, I am supposed to wait for the 2155 to cross, and then after that, I will take the next stochastic cross around, which then would tell me, you know, and you're, you're being very mechanical. You're not thinking. You're not planning. You're just waiting for things to do the things. And, hey, 60% of the time it works every time. So at the end of the week, at the end of the month, at the end of the year, you have this much profit and you've done this much work, okay? Rah! How many people here, how many people here have no problem as a currency trader working, let's say eight hours a day, just like a regular job. Eight hours a day, you're going to sit at your desk trading forex so either you're doing it now or you're not doing it now but that's how you see your your that's how you see you when you're successful and into the future and that's how you're going to run your fun all day every day okay yeah how many people would like to do it Less than a full-time job. I'll give you an example. I get a Barron's magazine. Comes once a week. What, one of the things I read in Barron's magazine is an overview of fund managers. Okay? Okay. They manage hundreds of millions of dollars. They pay themselves millions of dollars a year. Most of them do less than 25 trades a year. I was reading about one there in a part of California I'm familiar with. Uh, if, if you know Walnut Creek up, up in the, I guess you could still call it East Bay uh, of the Bay Area. Walnut Creek. Um and like I said, hundreds of millions of dollars, they, they personally pay themselves a million dollars a year or more, right? So they're making good money. And they have a meeting once a year to decide whether they should change one of their 13 stocks. They own 13 stocks. And once a year, they spend a good amount of research and then they come together as a team. There's only two or three of them. And they decide, should we change one of the 13 to something new? And most of the time, they're like, no. Nah. But boom, they pay themselves $100,000 a month each. Minimum, right? Minimum, 100 k a month. Minimum. It's probably two or 300000 per month. And they might, might have a trade once a year. Isn't that interesting? So make sure, right? Make sure that you have a good balance. Okay? Make sure you have a good balance. I, you certainly do not have to spend eight hours a day in front of your charts. You certainly can. Right? Now, here's what I used to do. I would break things into chunks. So my alarm would go beep, 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 and I'd say, I gotta go trade Shanghai. Okay, actually it used to be Japan. Beep, 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 right? Probably, I think it was 7.15, my alarm would go off because 8 p.m., it was Tokyo open. So I, I'd be out with the buddies or something or just hanging out at home or beep, 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 
oh, got to go to Tokyo. And, you know, trading gold and stuff out of Tokyo is fun, right? So I'm like, got to go. Trade some gold in Tokyo. Plus, it just sounds badass, right? I bought gold in Tokyo and I sold it in Shanghai. <laughs> right? Then I'd set up, while I'm doing that, I'm setting up my Asia fade trades. And then you got your London Open. But that's pa-ching, pa-chong. And in California, that was a different, difficult one. So I basically was teaching myself to swing trade through the Asian fade setups. And then I had my gold and oil trades, like I told you last week or the week before. So I typically trade those around 7 in the morning. I'm typically done gold and oil by, you know, 9.30, 9.45, like not even looking at them anymore. Uh, currency trading, you have the scalp at 8.30 with news, right? And then 9.30, the stock market open, but there's typically a front run, stock market front run at 9. So typically, I have my stop at break even at 9.15, and I, I'm already front running the equity open. And then you got the news at 10. If there's no news at 10, there's something different. So I used to teach this thing you know, about... Um, 9.55 versus 10.34. I don't know if you guys remember that, but how you adjust your positions in your shorter term trades based on the 10 o'clock news or lack of news, right? And then when that's done, then you got your London close, right? So around 10.45, 10.55, I'm setting up the, the close at 11.30, right? Then you, then you got lunch and then things die off. Then you got the after lunch. By lunch, I mean New York. So London's closed now. Then the American boys go have their, the New York boys go have their lunch. Then around 1.30, you got to get ready for commodity close. So you got the grains, you got pigs and cows, and you got the energy markets. So typically, the energy market is the one I would do, right? So there's one at 1.30, and then at 2, you should be doing oil because it closes at 2.30, and you get the volatility there. Then you take another little break, and then you got to get start get ready for the uh, the equity close at four and four fifteen is when futures close. So you got sort of the three forty five to four forty five mad rush for the close, and there's some nice volatility there. Then you got the rollover at five, which you could even trade the rollover and pick up the the um, the the swap. And then at five, you can actually go take a break because now your alarm's not going to go off until 7.15 until you got Asia. So then you start trading gold in, in Tokyo. Okay. Now in there, you could also throw in the Kiwi Open because New, New Zealand opens many hours before Australia because Australia delays their stock market open to time it with Japan and Korea. Okay, so now you can all even throw in if there's news in New Zealand, right? Boom, then you could do that as well, which is sort of just after the New York close. Okay, and that's a day. What do you guys think about that? That's all right, that was my day. I would not just sit up my charts, there's there are about 90 minute periods, 90 minutes, go away for a bit, come back, 90 minutes, go away, come back, for, right, 90 minutes, go away for a bit, come back, 90 minutes, go away for a bit, come back. What are your thoughts on that? Some people say hectic, some people say fun. Uh, after 10 years, uh, it's less fun, but it's certainly interesting. Okay. Now notice though, if all you do is look at Euro dollar, it ain't going to work for you. You, 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 you. Right? You just, you're not getting it. Like things happen for a reason is what I just explained. Okay. Things happen for a reason. Did you get that part that I didn't just sit and trade Euro dollar for 20 hours a day? Things happen for a reason at predictable times. That's genius. 
Amateur is just trade euro dollar all day with mediocre results. Okay. I literally go away, come back. I have alarms on my phone. Got to go. Got to trade some gold. Okay. Or you learn how to swing trade. And swing trading is I'll sell it here. I'll come back in a week and see how it worked out. Hopefully I can move my stop to break even by Wednesday. I can teach you how to do both, by the way. I can teach you how to do both. Swing trading is, I believe, the better model because it's more trend-based. It's more research-based. There's more planning involved. You get unlucky less often because unlucky could be short-term volatility the wrong way or a spread widens or some weird news comes out and pops it for two hours. You lose a bunch of money and then it goes back to doing what it was doing. Enough, Bradley. Enough. Okay. Bradley, my goal... <clears throat> Here's my pen. My goal, to answer that in a different way, Bradley, my goal is 5 to 7% per month. If it's more than that, it's because it's part of seasonality and it's a it's one of the months that you're supposed to do well. There are times when it's less than that, but once again, based on seasonality, those are the months you would expect to be less than average. So this has to do with my, um, my alpha is congruent, let's say, to the beta. So the beta dictates. So really what you're going to see is more like, let's say, minus 1, to plus two, some months, and other months, um, plus 12. When you're getting more than 12%, you're probably doing too much risk and you need to throttle back. Okay. And you're like, well, Wayne, that doesn't sound like a lot. My, uh, my cousin Billy makes 300% a month. Good. Invest your life savings with your cousin Billy. Good luck. But when you compound that, you're looking at 100% a year. Okay. The goal, oh, by the way, and if you did that, it that's sick. Ridiculous, crazy good. Right? Stock market is, what is it right now, plus 6% for the year? And you're like, yeah, I had a bad year. I'm only up 88%. I was hoping for a little more, but I got caught on that pullback back in February. You remember that? So, yeah, I'm only up 88%. Like, it's stupid. It's retarded. At some point, that's too much. And you have to keep telling yourself, you don't want these big numbers. I make 100% a year, like, F you, you do. Like, no one wants that. Okay? So, like, one of my friends manages, or used to manage, how much was it? I'm trying to get the number right. I think it was $26 billion. I have to double check that. Okay, not really a friend of mine, but anyways. Uh, he managed 26 billion. Okay? His goal for the year, 8%. That's all he cared about. That's it. That's it. 8%. Every year, year after year. You have to understand poor people are looking for a, to get rich. Rich people are already rich. So your sales pitch is, hey, rich dude, if you give me money, I will make you rich. And he's like, I'm already rich. Like, it's not a valid sales pitch. But you could say, I can pay for your inflation. 
of 2% a year, right? I can give you some wiggle room of another, let's say, 3%. And then after that, you can spend the 3% on anything you want. If you want to buy a, a bigger yacht, a faster car, a, a, a new watch, you can just spend this and it's free money. And you'll be a little bit richer than you were last year. Your, your inflation is covered, so that means you're exactly as rich as you were last. Plus, I got this wiggle room of 3%, so your assets actually are 3% richer. Plus, this other 3%, you can do whatever you want, spend it on anything frivolous. This should go to assets. So you might take that out and buy some real estate. You might take that out and buy some gold. You might take that out and give it to a hedge fund or something. But that, that's free money. and Well, that's reinvestable money. But this, this is silly money. This is Vegas money. This is trips around the world, vacations for three months money. This is play money, F you money, whatever. It's anything you want. That's my gift to you. Okay? That's the sales pitch that wins. You understand that? So this whole idea like, I make 100% a year, okay, your idiot uncle might give you 10 grand. And you will double it. Let's say you're successful. So now he's got 20 grand. So he's made 10 grand, but he's going to pay you 30%. So now he's got seven grand, seven K, and he paid you three K, and you're like three thousand dollars for a year of work. What the hell? I guess I need to make a thousand percent a year. No, yeah, to do that you gotta jack up leverage and dead, 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 dead. You're poor, your uncle's pissed off, and that's the end of that. Or you find someone with money that could put in, let's say, a million dollars. And you're like, I can give you 100% a year. And they're like, what the F are you talking about? Well, I'll make you rich. I'm already rich. So if I can just throw a million dollars at you and, like, take a take a chance with you, like, just have some fun with a million dollars, then by definition, I'm already rich. So your sales pitch doesn't mean anything to me. It just sounds like you're going to lose a million dollars. I can lose a million dollars by... I don't know, crashing my Bugatti. Might as well buy a Bugatti than have you lose the money. You see what I mean? So you guys have to start thinking the right ways, right? And that's why to answer that question, it's much better to, to you know, even the 5% is really, you know, you're, you're making 5 to 7% a month and the stock market is making 5 to, let's, what, what's a good, a crazy year is 15, right? 5 to 15 is really the range for the for your if you were if you will if you were doing a comp now you're an absolute return as a forex trader you're an absolute return fund which means you cannot say things like well the stock market was down 10 percent this month and i was down eight percent so i'm good okay this is what long short equity guys say well, the stock market is down 10. We're only down eight. So it was a good year. Woohoo! Okay. As a Forex trader, you can't say that. You're an absolute return fund, which means F you, you're supposed to be plus eight. In fact, you promised them plus 80. Good luck, right? Well, of course we can. Okay. But five to seven a month, and the and professionals are thinking five to seven a year. You understand, like just there is no congruency. It's like laughable, ridiculously sickening amateur hour to a professional investor. I'm not saying you. I mean, from the point of view of a professional investor, like yeah, I'll throw you a million, but you're not even speaking the same language, right? So an institution, what they do, like I said, the eight percent. The institution, two to inflation, two goes to I, 
right? Five goes to their budget. And one is some wiggle room. Okay, let me explain something to you. I probably shouldn't be giving all this information for free, huh? And <laughs> this is probably 99% of the money in the world. 99% of the money thinks this way. But if you don't have any money, you don't know that. That's why I'm saying it's a different language. And if you show your trade results to someone with money and you're doing 1,000% a year or 500% a year or even 100% a year, they go, what the F are you doing? And then they're like, dude, we can't even run a risk-adjusted performance analysis on your numbers. And you look at them, you're like, what the hell is a risk-adjusted performance analysis? You see what I mean? And they're like, dude, you're from a different planet. We're institutional, and you must be retail, because none of this makes sense to us. None. There's no way we're going to give you tens of millions, hundreds of millions of dollars with what you do. Right? Pure mathematics is institutional trades, trade with huge uh, amounts. No, actually, they don't. Okay, you don't. So, for example, um, I, I, I don't even know the number. I'd have to ask. I'd have to give them a call. But, like, they, they constantly invest in the hedge funds, right? When you have that kind of money, institutional investors, in, uh, uh, institutional investors invest into institutional traders and trading programs, or like a hedge fund, for example, right? And so they interview traders all day and track records all day, and they do all these analysis on the results and, and all this kind of stuff, right? So they might just throw you 50M and see how you do for a while, okay? And that might sound like a lot of money to you. And maybe these guys are dropping... Um, you know, let's say five to 10 million on positions. Now I'm talking equity, which is different from Forex, but whatever, because remember they're not leveraged and all that kind of stuff, but they're dropping this kind of money and you're might like, dude, 10 million and you only have 50. Yeah, but on 26 bill, on 26 B, 26 B. Okay, these are big, granted that's a big number, but that's a drop in the bucket. Okay, but my point is I just want you to think differently. Okay, that's all. I want you to look at this as a, as a big business that you can get involved in because I know you can do this. And, and the funniest thing, you don't know it now or you don't believe me now or you're just not ready to hear and see the message now, but the world needs you. Okay, the world needs you. The world needs you to do this. That money, that 99% of the money I just told you about, they need you. They're desperate, I'm telling you, they're desperate to find you. So these guys, big institutional money, they spend the vast majority of their time trying to find you. I am not joking. Three, four, five meetings a day, they're going through fund managers trying to find them. Right? These rich guys are leaning over, my precious money, my precious money. Right? <laughs> they need you to obsess over the money for them. Okay? Joel says, Wayne, uh, three is, is three percent enough? Yeah, yeah. Well, if you're doing like five to seven, you're doubling the money every year. So yeah. So let me ask you, Joel, is fifty percent a year enough? When was the last time the stock market went up fifty percent in one year? It's 
been a while. And that would be, right, an anomaly. You're supposed to be a machine. So even 50% is redonkulous. Here's what people care about, guys. You ready for this? Maybe you want to write this down. This is what you should be working toward. Low risk. Consistent. I didn't spell that right. Sorry. Returns. It's all they care about. So the first thing they're going to look at you at look at when they're reviewing you and your fund and your your history is low risk. If you can't prove that, done. It's you're dead in the water. And most people are dead in the first 12 seconds. Joel walks into the front of the room. Sorry to pick on you, Joel. Joel walks in the front of the room. And the first question is, okay, tell me about your fund and what you guys do. And Joe ba Joel babbles for seven minutes about everything and nothing at all. And Joel's fund just lost the deal. <laughs> just it's dead. You're like, oh, my God. I mean, right? You, you just can't bumble and stumble your way through it. So... Once you, you present your company, they want your your uh, they want your, re, your your trading history, and they're going to analyze it for one thing only: low risk, low risk, low risk, low risk, low risk, low risk, low risk. Hi, right? I make 150% a year. Does not sound like low risk. Return is a function of risk. High return, high risk. Not interested. Pass. That's all they do, all day, low risk, low risk. Then they say, wow, this is really, it's got uh, low drawdowns, right? So we'll do it this way. Low drawdowns, low DD, right? L low, and this is supposed to be narrow, low vol. Low volatility, low drawdowns, low risk. Oh, this has potential. Let's take a look at the returns is the next question. You see, almost nobody passes this. So I want you, I'm trying to train you to tr trade institutionally. So maybe the first step, if you're retail and you don't have a lot of money, like most people in retail, that's us, by the way, non-institutional, then try to every year lower your risk. So if you made a thousand percent this year because you only started with 10 grand or something, then next year try to only make 500 percent. And then the next year try to only make 200 percent. And then the next year try to get it down to 100 percent. And you're laughing at me as I say this. You're like, Wayne, that's retarded. Why wouldn't I just make a thousand percent a year? Because one year you're going to lose a hundred percent. Losing 100% is more likely than making 1,000%. So I'm trying to, like everyone else, like institutionally, losing a lot is much easier than making a lot, okay? And the only way to make a lot is to take risk. So I'm saying every year, reduce your risk. Now, I wrote a book on this, and I said, as your account size grows, do not increase your lot size the same as your account is growing. So, right? So if your account is up 200%, only increase your lot size by 100%. And then you're up again the next year, 200%, only increase it by 100. And your increases are way behind, right? Which means every trade becomes significantly less risk per trade. You can tell you get to your account size is huge and relative to your account size, your, your trade positions are small, but you're paying yourself huge sums of money because your account size grew. What you don't want to do, here's what you don't want to do. Let's say you make uh, $50,000 in one year trading Forex. 
That's your profit. What did you start with? <laughs> right? And let's say you made you started with 10 and now it's 50, so you're up $40,000. Okay? These are big numbers, and I'm just throwing them out. As you would pay yourself, you end up starting over again. And it's like starting in a new business. It's like opening a restaurant, working all year, day and night, night and day, not taking holidays, sweating bullets, missing family time, hard work stuff. Okay? And at the end of the year, you turn to profit. Guess what? You're going to close the restaurant down, start over on a shoestring budget, and struggle again. Hire new staff, train new staff, find new uh, chefs, create new menus, do all your marketing again, and start your business over every year. That's not even a business, right? I think I used the example of flipping houses. Why would you flip a house? I'd rather borrow a huge sum of money from a bank and buy an apartment building with 300 doors than flipping one house every few months. Because once you flip your house and you made your money, now you got to find another house. You're constantly just looking for another house. That's not a business. You're getting paid for your time. That's poverty. You never want to work based on time. That's poverty. That's why I asked you guys, do you want to work eight hours a day trading? And you're like, yeah, it sounds like fun. I'm like, it sounds like poverty. You can do a lot of money, or you can make a lot of money doing it. And so, but trust me, after doing that for 10 or 15 or 20 years, you start to realize it's a lot of work. It's a lot of work. Holy smokes. Um, so you want to incorporate more than what's needed to trade like I just told you. I went through 20 different setups in a day, not 20, but more than 12 of how I break down a day. Or you can just swing trade. But I, but I want I want you to do both. I want you to carry trade. I want you to position trade. And, and you know, for carry trades, you need to understand macroeconomics, central banking policy, and, and so you can catch swaps, right? Uh, position trading, you really need to understand things like seasonality. Then there's swing trading, day trading, intraday trading, and scalping. Well, at the end of 20 years, you should be an expert on, on all of that. And then, of course, be an expert in fundamental analysis, right? That's where you should be. You should know all of that. Okay? You should know all of that. Okay? But make sure... You, you got the, your eyes on the, on the on the proper prize. Meaning, at some point, you need to train yourself that risk is bad, consistency is good. Right? And if you can do that, guys, maybe not five years from now. Maybe it'll take you five years to put together a track record that shows you can take low risk trades and consistently make turns. Now, the consistent returns are important because remember, I'm trying to show you that institutional investors, they only want eight. Hey, if you gave them 10, they would be tickled pink. They'd probably double your stack. But more than that, they're like, whoa, whoa, whoa. So maybe you're, you're trying to do 10, but you're promising eight, okay, that kind of stuff. Some years maybe only do six, and they're like, ooh, okay. It eats into one year's budget. Now, their budgets are usually five years out and stuff like that. So what they're trying to – what they're, the way they look at you is your, your cash flow, your income stream. They have this money. Money makes money. That's, that's why I'm trying to teach you to think this way. Money makes money. Money is like employees. It works for you. Okay? 
So you have to deploy your capital, get it doing things that give you a return. So that's why they say we're looking for an 8 to 10 percent. 8 percent would be great. That's a great year, 8 percent. But we want it this year. We want it next year. We want the year before. And you're like, hey, but I can make a lot more money. Whoa, whoa, we're not interested in that. It's already a lot of money. We don't need more. We need income. And that and that money is going to sit there and every year it's going to pay all our bills, all our salaries, all our expenses, everything we do, and we get to continue doing it. Whether it's an institutional or a wealthy person, a sheikh in Dubai, a prince of, you know, uh, of Dubai, right? What does he want? He's got a lot of money. Great. More money? They're not interested in more money. They wanted more money? It just comes out of the ground, guys. It just bu bubbles out of the ground. Not in Dubai, but in Abu Dhabi or Saudi Arabia, a rich Saudi prince. Like, I can make you a lot of money. Dude, they have so much money, they don't know what to do with it. So, right? So what you're going to do is say, look, you can buy all your yachts and all your cars and all that kind of stuff, and none of it is going to come out of your principal. All of that is free. That's the pitch that works, guys. You can run this institution, you can run this endowment, you can run this university, you can run this hospital, you can run this insurance company for free because of me. I will cover your inflation, right, the, the increasing costs every year. I'll cover your entire budget, which means everyone around you, including yourself, gets paid a salary. And on top of that, I'll leave a little cushion just in case because... Everyone, like no one wants to get fired. Everyone wants to come to this institution, whether it's a hospital or a museum or like or an insurance company, whatever, that all the debts are going to be covered. All the expenses like salaries are covered. And at the end of the year, everyone does what whatever keeps them busy. Everyone's busily doing things. And that pile of cash is still there and it's a little bit bigger. That's all they care about. If that pile of cash grew by 1%, but everything else got paid for it, they don't give it down. You don't need, like, oh, we have $26 billion, but only if we had $27 billion, we'd be so much better off. You're not any better off. Another billion is not important. Doing what's important is important and having the money pay for it for free. If you buy a Lamborghini, you are poor. If your Lamborghini is free, you are wealthy. You see what I mean? That's where we got to go. That's where I'm taking you. That's where your your the mind shift is going, right? If you want a yellow Lamborghini, buy an apartment building with 300 doors on it, 300 people paying you rent. But the rent covers the mortgage, the rent covers the expenses, the rent co covers the, the cost of financing, and what's left over is your yellow Lamborghini that you didn't pay a penny for. And then when it's all over, you sell your apartment building and you make millions. You buy five Lamborghinis, and all five Lamborghinis were free. Or you go to a Lamborghini dealership and you pay $2,000 a month on your credit card. right? Free. Rich people want free. They don't want more money. They want free. A free yacht, free gas, free private jet, free dream wedding for their daughter. Harvard for free. If you can promise that, everything in your life is going to be free. Okay, we got a request for uh, beast, but let's just quickly do the yens. Okay. Okay, beast. Okay. What do we do here? Well, there's a counter trend, right? We know this sets up a counter trend. That puts us a target way up here. I already have this identified as a possible role reversal. So I'm going to identify plan A and plan B. There they are. Plan A, plan B, if you're a bear. Okay, let's go further up. Okay, 
Is it plausible this is a double bottom? Yeah. But you have to decide, is it or is it not? So you're either a buyer down here or your seller here and here. Okay. So let's, uh, let's mark this up. Oops, of course, yellow, not going to work. Okay. You're thinking, uh, how would I do this? Mm. I guess M1 would be my line and that. Okay. Now bears are thinking something different. Okay. They're thinking A or they're thinking B. Which one do you want to be? Well, let's simplify this. Are you a trend trader or counter trend trader? Are you trading reversals or extensions? I don't know if this is going to make a lower low. Seasonality wise, this is when I'm hoping it makes higher highs. But I already told you, I don't think I would buy the pound. Okay. By the way, if you like these templates, you can download them for free. And let me ask you, how many people here have installed my chart templates? You downloaded my chart templates for free. You've installed them, and maybe you actually use them. Economics related to currencies, uh, Harvard, <laughs> I don't know. I'm all self-taught, so I just did research. Lots of people. Thank you, guys. Of course, says Callie. All right, I, I want to ask you for something. If you use them and you love them, give me one cent. Give me a one sentence, maybe two sentence testimonial on this video. So when the video, once the webinar is over and you're able to leave a comment, leave one to two sentences as a testimonial. I can't imagine trading without FX Bootcamp chart templates. Yeah, Peter, I'm updating everything. That's what this is about. Don't write a paragraph. Don't write a sales pitch. You use them, you love them. Something like that. Okay? And so I'm updating the chart template website, and I'd just like to maybe have you like take a little screenshot of, uh, of what you wrote on YouTube and it just shows your YouTube name and it shows your little thing and I'll just put it up there something like that okay also I would like some volunteers at some point that have completed the uh, video training courses at FX Bootcamp I'm thinking I'd like to pick five or six people maybe send someone out to interview you and take your picture and Write like a case study. You don't have to be a, you know, I took the, I took Wayne's, uh, I took the FX Bootcamp video courses, now I'm a billionaire. No, 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 no. But I'm interested in learning how people have implemented it in their trading, whether they do what I do or something slightly different, but sort of how the knowledge is Im impacted and ideally improved their own personal methodology for trading, for research, for trade planning, for how they trade, whatever the case may be. So I might be, I might look for five, even 10 people that would be, that would have compelling stories for a case study. Okay. Yes, that would be good through. So but don't put it here. When this video is over, put that same comment onto the YouTube comment section below the video because this doesn't get saved. Okay.
Guys, not here. Those are great comments. Not here. Not in the chat. The chat doesn't get saved. In the comment section. If you want to put them in yesterday's or la the last video, that would be cool too. Okay. But I think it'd be cool to like send a, a writer, uh, like a reporter and a cameraman, maybe out to your home office, or maybe uh, I fly out and meet you at the local Ritz Carlton or something and uh, do a little interview, learn, learn how you, I'd like to see how you're doing and what you're doing. <clears throat> cool. Thank you guys. Just, I've been thinking over the weekend, part of my meditation, when you hike five miles up a mountain, I know five miles doesn't sound hard, uh, difficult, except if it's up, <laughs> five miles up is enough. Anyways. Uh, yeah. Oil. Uh, yeah. We're at the bottom of the range. Don't you stink? Uh, I don't want oil to drop below 5250, for example. Uh, we started right where you'd expect as a bear. So bears did what they did and what they should do. And there is no middle. And this is a great comment. Uh, you know, I've pointed out multiple times. I don't really care about the central pivot. A lot of people make a big stink about the central pivot, mostly because I... I think they don't know how to trade pivot points, but they see people using pivot points and they assume that that central is important because it's the central. And why wouldn't it be important? Uh, well, it, it's not important because it means the same thing to both bulls and bears. So why would it be important? It's, it's important lies if there's a strong trend, really. And it has more to do with aggressiveness of either the bulls or the bears more than any other importance. Uh, in a sideways market like oil, it means nothing. It means probably a great place to lose money. So anyway, so I'm thinking um, this lower level is, well, it's not, it's more supportive than anything, right? So if we're going to